just loved that anthem y'all did. That was wonderful. Especially when the, the yeah, give them a round of applause. Especially when the folks on the bells went, that was, I love that. That was great, the church bells. Happy New Year! Y'all think I've really lost it, haven't you? As Christians, our first day of the new year is today, the first Sunday of Advent. And so we know how to start it right. We start the year with Christmas. So I say again, Happy New Year! Happy New Year! There you go. I say I got Merry Christmas behind me. See? Still. All I want for Christmas is... It happened at 8, it happened at 9.30, it's happened... Two front teeth. All I want for Christmas is... That is a phrase that they have said for generations. Children and parents alike, over the years, all I want for Christmas is. And usually, that's followed by some phrase that's indicative of where you are in your life's journey. So, as a child, when I said, all I want for Christmas is... That was followed by the Sears and Roebuck catalog. I mean, go big or go home, right? As a teenager, all I want for Christmas is was followed by some technological gadget. So, you know, still a toy. As a married adult, it was followed by something I wanted for the house. And from some perspective, still considered a toy. Because, come on, it... (laughs) If you need lights for the kitchen and the living room, and you can buy ones that you can turn on and off with your voice, and you can make them change colors, it's still good, right? This doesn't have to just be a toy. But as we, as we engage in relationship, as our perspectives deepen and widen, the answer to that question often changes. As a father, with a father of my own that was ill several years ago, As a father of a child who has a medical condition that we are going through moment by moment and he's taking it like a champ. As a father with a child that next fall is going to be a freshman in high school and starting a new journey and wanting everything to go well for him. As the father of someone who is going to graduate this fall and leave me and go to college. That one's hitting hard. Right, oh, it breaks my heart. But I'm so excited for him and the the journey that he's going on, all these wonderful acceptance letters that he's got one on Thanksgiving, uh, accepting him into USF in Tampa if he wants that one. I'm so stinking proud of him. Florida Southern, uh, Flagler, um, USF in Tampa, I think there's one other. There's a couple more that are out there. He's gotten into all of them. So there's this wonderful journey that he's getting started on. All I want for Christmas, the answer to that question changes. What we want shifts. From being about ourselves to being about others, from being about what we want to being about what God desires for all of humanity and all of his creation. Today, as we enter into the season of Advent, this is a season of waiting. It's a season of preparation. It's a season that that can seem to almost happen overnight if we let it, but it begs for us to to slow down and to experience it with a, a richness and a fullness that this world often won't let us have. Advent is a season of hope, of peace, of joy, of love, hope in, in what is and what could be. Peace is understood much different than what is commonly thought of. Joy as something that is not from the realm of the temporary and love from the variety that is unearned. And when we feel it and experience it, it changes us from the inside out. Each of these bringing with them a a real sense of anticipation about about what God will do during this Advent. So this Advent, is as often as you can, as often as you remember, as often as you, you find a space for it, I want you to ask yourself the question, all I want for Christmas is. Now, when I was in high school, the, the church that I attended was extremely blessed to have an in-house playwright. This woman would write us two plays a year, one at Easter and one at Advent, and Debbie and I were largely involved in it, so we would get our scripts about three months out for when Lois wanted to put the play on. 
And you see, the most intriguing part about Lois being our playwright is she didn't start doing this until she was 90 years old. (laughs) Right? Tell me God's ever done with us. 90 years old, she, she felt that she had this gift, and she did. She would put together these most beautiful stories of, of journeys and understanding and faith. And so I had to ask, I said, Lois, out of all the years that you could have done this, why, why 90? And she said, Daryl, God has blessed me, and I've gone many places. I've seen many things. I've had incredible experiences over these 90 years And I thought this would be a good way to share them. A good way to share what what God has done in and through my life. And folks, she was absolutely right. The, the, The stories and the scenes that she would set up and describe were just magnificent. Lois also understood something else at the young age of 90, that even though she had the ability to write these plays, directing was not part of that gift set. So she solicited another lady in our congregation, Sandy, who ended up having the gift to direct. Sandy could give us these wonderful instructions about about where to stand and where to look and how to turn our head and what to do with our hands, make sure that our voices were loud enough that we were projecting them off the back wall. She loved this work, and she did it tirelessly, always working behind the scenes, so much so that every now and then you would catch someone by surprise when you tell them, oh yeah, Sandy's been a huge part of this. Well, I never saw her. No, she's been behind the scenes making this happen. And without Sandy, as wonderful as these stories were, no matter how good we did as the the actors portraying them, they never would have gotten off the ground if it hadn't been for Sandy and all of the work that she did behind the scenes. You know, as we think about how relationships and life work, it's much the same way. For any truly great thing to happen, there has to be work done behind the scenes. And I'm talking more than about literary works. I'm talking more than about stage productions. I'm talking about relationships, experiences, talking about life itself. In the manger scene from Matthew, we see God working tirelessly behind the scenes so that this can be a moment of hope, not only for for the people that were there then, but for all of us now. In the beginning of this passage, a few things have happened that we need to be aware of. First, we learn that Mary and Joseph are engaged. Next, we read that Mary is already with child. Third, we come to understand that Joseph has been informed of Mary's pregnancy, although he does not yet understand its divine source. And finally, we discover that Joseph has decided to avoid the letter of the law and to simply divorce Mary quietly. It's what happens next that we see how deeply and how completely God gives us hope. Now, at this point in the story, everything is centered around Jesus. Now, we the reader, we understand that that Mary is pregnant. We understand that her child is Jesus the Christ. And while we know who Jesus is, and we understand what that means, Joseph, he was still in the dark about how all of this was going to unfold. He didn't quite understand what it meant for them now, and he certainly was not thinking about the impact it was going to have on you and me. He's told to take Mary as his wife in a dream. He's visited by an angel. He's clued into what is really happening, what his role is going to be in this wonderful miracle, and that when all this happens, that the birth she is going to give is going to be to God's son. And they are to name him Emmanuel, God with us. You see, everything is about the baby. Now, I'm sure you've all seen a manger scene, and if you haven't, we've got one that's about... What do you say? About that tall, sitting right there in our narthex. Go spend time with it. Look at the players. Look at how they're positioned. You'll notice that every single one of them is all looking in one direction. At the baby. I get it. Babies are cute. Babies are adorable. And a clean baby is one of the best smelling things in all of the world. So I get the importance of focusing all of this on the baby. Jesus came as a baby, and that is where our hope lies. 
You see, God came as a, a helpless, dependent, vulnerable baby. Did not come as a mighty warrior or a powerful king. He came into this world the exact same way you and I did. Now, he could have come triumphantly, but by coming in as we did, he creates a bond with you and I, a shared experience between all of us, a bond that was best accomplished by coming into this world the way he did. Now, to understand that, that Jesus came as fully human in order to connect with us shows us just how important we are to him. And it's in that importance that we find great hope for the law, lives that we're called to live for him and with him. But you see, it's not only the act of Jesus coming to earth as a human baby that is remarkable, it's also who he chose to be the mom and the dad. He didn't choose the king and queen of some powerful land. He didn't choose some beloved religious leader. He chose two very ordinary people. I've often thought that if Mary and Joseph had not been the earthly parents of Jesus, would we utter their names with the same reverence that we do today? Would we know who they were? Would they simply be two names on a family tree that has long been forgotten and set aside? You know, there was nothing particularly special about either one of them, but I think that's the point. God trusting these two ordinary people to be the caretakers of his one and only son. To provide for God in human form. Here God is telling us that we, we do not have to be socially important or powerful or some sort of world leader for God to love us and for God to invite us to do his work. You know, there's great hope in that knowledge that God loves all of us so fully and completely, that we're all important to God, that none of us are, are outcast or forgotten. The fact that, that we are all actually preferred in the eyes of God. God prefers to spend time with you, to be with you, to walk with you. There's hope in the knowledge that you are preferred, that you are necessary, and that through all of that loved, each and every one, you know, we also find hope in God's faithfulness, a faithfulness that we, plot, that we find played out in this story if we look closely. You see, through Mary's pregnancy, through Joseph's processing of what is happening, there's a lot of emotion. For just a second, I want to invite you to, to put yourself in their shoes. You have a young, unwed woman in this culture that is now pregnant. You have a man who is engaged to this young, unmarried woman in this culture. Together, they're trying to figure out, how did this happen? How do we tell mom and dad? How do we tell our, our family, our neighbors, our friends? There's a lot of emotion that is happening during them processing all of this that is happening. And, and all of this is initiated by God. Yet God is faithful to both of them. God reassures Mary as we read about in other gospels. God sends angels to Joseph to, to explain what is happening and to give him guidance in this very puzzling time. Neither of them left alone to, to figure this out. Neither of them abandoned in this seemingly very difficult situation. You know, and it's in situations that are difficult. It's in the, the hectic times of life that we often fail to see God or to feel God's presence. We wonder sometimes if God's even there in the midst of those challenges. But God is. God's always there, supporting us, guiding us, most importantly, loving us, and at times doing it very much behind the scenes. Just as God did with this young mother and this new father. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Many years ago, Debbie's very first appointment, she was figuring out what it meant to be a pastor, first time doing it. I was figuring out what it mean, meant to be a good preacher's wife. I sat in the front row. You got that, did you? 
I sat in the front row. I, I took attendance for the folks that were there. I made sure everything was going smoothly. I got her water if she needed it. I, I fixed something if it went wrong. And one particular Sunday, we were finishing up worship. We had sang the last song. Debbie had offered the benediction. And I was gathering up all of my, all of my paper, all of my information. And a woman behind me tapped me on the shoulder. And I thought one of two things are going to happen. Either she just wants to tell me good morning, or I was also Debbie's administrative assistant at this church. So she was going to tell me about one of the 55 typos that I saw in the bulletin. Uh, so I turn around and, and I smile and she goes, I've been praying for you. And I stopped, I froze. And my first reaction was, why? I don't know you. I mean, I know your name, but only because I marked your attendance in the office. But we don't have a, a relationship. I haven't shared anything with you. So, so I was curious, why are you praying for me? And all this is going through my head as I, I'm trying to process the situation in front of me. You see, what she didn't know was not only was Debbie learning to be a pastor, I was learning to be a pastor's spouse. I was learning to be an, an administrative assistant following in the, the footsteps of my mama who'd been one for, since before I was born. I was also going back to school to follow the calling that God had placed on my life to go to seminary. I was going back to school after the University of South Florida. Some of you know this about me. The University of South Florida had just recently permanently academically dismissed me for my sterling .71 GPA. And I'm thinking, yeah, it can get that low. And I, I was thinking, how, how, how am I going to do all this? But there was so much going on that I was frozen. I wasn't thinking about any of that. I didn't have the, the bandwidth to process any of that. I was only doing what showed up right in front. It was all I could do to survive. I, haven't, I had not at that point even admitted to myself the trouble I was in. And so if I hadn't articulated it to myself, how in the world did she know? And then she took a step back, not quite sure how I was responding to all of this. And she said, I don't know why. I just felt like I was supposed to. So I just wanted you to know that I've been praying for you. And that's when all of it kind of broke loose. You do have a lot going on. You've got a lot of new in your life. You haven't quite figured out how this is all going to work. And prayer is one of the best things you could have right now. You know, her prayer is what helped me connect the dots in that moment. Her prayer is what opened my eyes and gave me the ability to articulate what I needed from God and what I needed to name so that I could start learning how to process it and how to deal with it. Well, I thanked her for it profusely. I, I said, I appreciate you being faithful to what God called you to do. I could always use prayer. And then as everybody started filing out, I just turned around and I sat down. I didn't do my normal thing of, of going out and standing next to Debbie and greeting folks. I didn't start turning off lights or sound boards, which I typically did. I just, just sat. And I just allowed that moment to happen, to just be. I didn't try to, to understand it. I didn't try to, to, to put it in a box. I didn't try to unpack it. I just, I just sat there. And I thought, wow. Even when I don't know it, even when I can't put words to it, God knew I had a need. God knew I needed someone to, to, to stand in that gap with me, to, to let me know that I was important, to let me know that somebody was thinking about me. I thought, oh my word, behind the scenes, this, this whole time before I ever got to a point where I could name it, you were working. Before I ever got to a point where I, I understood that there was a lot going on, you were already dispatching people to pray for me. You've been at work for a long time. And I didn't even know it. Behind the scenes, providing setting things up, putting things in place so they would be there when I needed them the most. Mary and Joseph, in this situation, both in seemingly hopeless situations, 
But God provided. God sheltered. God directed. And he did something in those moments that not only changed their lives then, but changed the world forever. That is the thing about hope. It is so much more than, than hope for things that make us happy, typically for just a, a brief moment in time, or hope for, for something that will get us out of a bad situation. Hope is about making things better for everybody. Hope is about seeing the best in others. Hope is about seeing the best in ourselves. Hope is about looking at this world and opening yourself up to be the conduit by which God is made known in our midst. Hope is what gives us the strength to carry on in tough times. It's what helps us see past difficult seasons, gives us the desire to, to move through them. Hope is what Scripture is all about. Hope that through God's love, presence, and grace in our lives, we will overcome all things. Hope that is proven time and time again in its pages. Hope as found in the Gospels that can change so much for us, about us, and within us. Earlier this week, Pope Francis put it this way. He said, if we put the Gospel at the center and bear witness to it with fraternal love, love for everyone, we will be able to look to the future with hope, whatever the tempests, great or small, that we may experience today. I mean, when you're at home paying the bills, when you're at the gas station and you're third in line for gas and you are on fumes, when you're headed to the Christmas party and you need to pick up a gift and you're standing in Target and the only thing you're looking at is a shelf full of dust bunnies, when you're just sitting at home Taking a breath. God is at work. God is moving. God is doing things. God is lining things up. God is faithful to be with us in the important times. He's faithful to be with us in the, the mundane times. And he's certainly <coughs> faithful to be with us in the difficult times. God's love is seen in the story of Mary and Joseph and the announcement of Jesus' arrival. And it's in that love that we see hope. Hope that fuels a great anticipation in the wonderful things that God does with us and through us each Advent season. Hope that tells us how much we mean to God. You know, this time of year can be very hectic, and I don't have to tell you that. That's something you already know because we still have everything that we have to do in a normal season, and then we add a whole bunch of stuff to it, because it's Christmas, because it's Advent. You know, we decorate our houses, we, we buy gifts, we, we go places, we do things, we volunteer, and, and sometimes we can get distracted, and we can lose sight of the fact that God is indeed with us. I know we've all seen those, those sayings like, Jesus is the reason for the season and, and keep Christ in Christmas. You can see them on magnets on cars, on signs in front of buildings, and, and signs in people's front yards. They're, they're everywhere, especially this time of year. But as I look and I see those, I ask myself the question, what have I done to apply that? What have I done to be different because of that? You know, when we're caught in the hustle and bustle of Christmas and we're looking, are we looking for the ways that God is at work even though we're physically not in the church building? You know, if you're, you're running your errands, if you're living your life, if you're doing those things, are we looking for God in those moments? Are we looking for God in the places that we least expect God to be? Like in line at the gas station. Are we looking behind the scenes for God and for the work that God is doing? That's the hope that I'm talking about with Advent. The hope, the, the anticipation of the wonderful things that God is going to do this year. 
So here's our challenge for all of us. But as we go through this Advent season, as we experience this time of Christmas and all that that brings with it, I want to challenge us not only to look for God in all that we do, expect it. Expect to find God. Expect and trust that God will be there. I want us to look and see where God is at work behind the scenes. What, what little thing might God be doing in your life or in the life of another to, to provide something in the moment that it's needed most? And it's my prayer that as we do that, that as we engage in that practice, that each and every one of us will find hope, that we'll be amazed with the, the wonder of a child at the extraordinarily good work that God is doing in us and through us. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we come before you this day and with hearts of gratitude, we thank you for all the work that you have done behind the scenes. For those little and small and big and grateful things that you have done to, to meet us where we are, to, to provide for us in the moment that we need it the most. Today we ask for the wisdom to never lose sight of you to never lose sight of, of what you're doing in our lives, what you're doing in the lives of others. Help us to have an expectant perspective, trusting, knowing with all that we are that you are faithful to be our God, that you are faithful to provide for those things that, that we need in those moments that we need them, also that we can be those conduits that bring you to life in the here and in the now. People need to know you. They want to know you. And you have decided that the, one of the best ways to do that is through all of humanity. You love us so dearly and so deeply that you, you shed everything you had and you, you walked across the cosmos and you entered this world as a dependent child, you put on our flesh. You experienced our grief. You endured our sorrows. You celebrated our joys. And you did all of it so that you can say that you are indeed one of us and you know what it means to be human. But you are also completely and fully divine. And in that bond that you created with us through your humanity, you have opened up a whole new perspective for us to understand this world and our place in it. You have shown us that, that we are important, that we are valuable, and, and that you have a role and a plan for all of us. Help us to live into that calling. Help us to be who you have called and created us to be. Help us to have the courage and the strength to look upon one another and see you reflected in their hearts. Remind us always and everywhere that as much and as deeply as you love us, you love all of humanity. Help us to love our neighbor. Help us to love you. And help us to live in the hope that you have provided day in and day out. And we faithfully and confidently pray all of this in the precious name of your son, Jesus, and all of God's people said,